All right, I, this is time for a little recap of how I got into this in the first place. I mean, I've done it all my life, but I didn't get really into it until I saw the stuff from Rodney. Let me show you. Okay, my friends, settle in, get ready. Most everybody knows me, probably knows Anton Petrov's channel, because he does all kinds of scientific things, as I do. And I saw this come up today. If this superconductor is real, it's a Nobel Prize. But let's talk first, because all they do is research these people with little equations and so forth. And you can manipulate that. So I, I, I was I'm wondering, what do you, let's talk first. Well, yeah, let's talk. So I go to get through it and find out a lot of these papers are just not really honest. Now, I because I, as soon as he talked about a superconductor at room temperature, I said, there's a problem here. And I'll explain to you why superconductors only happen when you suck out every extra electron, because there's, there's nothing to bump into. But that's called absolute zero. It means absolute zero electrons. And then instantaneously, as you flood it with electricity, it starts to be resistance. There's no superconductor. You have to suck all the electrons out to let it conduct through there. So there's no excess electrons in the way. You might get it to a point where it can conduct highly depending upon the combination of metals and so forth. I, I don't disagree with that, but it's absolutely no superconduction, no. Okay, my friends, this should be real fun. Anton Petrov is one of my favorite guys. He asks a lot of questions, but he sort of floats in the mainstream where I'm sort of on the edge and I want to discuss about superconductors. Now, he's saying if this super, superconductor is real, it's a Nobel Prize, but let's talk first. And then as I started to watch this, it just got real, real interesting. Okay, my outstanding friends, we're going to have fun today. Now, as most of you know, I cover a broad variety of subjects in my research, and it is researching. Everybody else searched, and then they said, okay, now it's all settled, and go home, everybody just keeps saying the same things. That's not, re that's not a full understanding. Things change, and a lot of them had little sections of research, and they did their researching there and said, okay, we're all done. Well, what about, how does it affect this one? How does that one affect that one? But it won't be the beginning of all. Very, very deep to ever get to the bottom of things. Because anyway, the point I'm making today is he's going to be talking about superconductivity, which is my that's my wheelhouse. And if you don't understand electron di dipole electron flood theory, you can't understand it. And, you, and if you don't think there's ether particles in space and all kinds of particles in space and dust and everything else uh, obstructing the other particles come through it because they're, they're fields. And I'm going to show all this in great detail. Now, I like Anton. He's good. And he's, he's coming up with something very, very, very interesting as I got into this. But let's see what super, superconductivity is first. And I'm going to tell you right now. Let's just start. And I'm going to make my claim right now. Superconductivity means you take every single excess electron out so all you have big just hard balls but normally they're filled up with all these clouds of little electrons floating around in there and that's what heat is the more of, of clouds of them are in there the hotter it gets the cooler it gets the less of them are in there you get the absolute zero means there's absolutely no more free electrons they're gone so when you put any electron in, in it goes superconductivity but it stops almost instantly because there will be start to be a pushback so Superconductivity is only instantaneous. Now they're talking about superconductivity first room temperatures. Superconductivity at room temperatures. Now these are big articles by big special people that are in the special realm of academic sciences. And they have to impress their friends. Or they're nothing. <laughs> I don't have to impress anybody because I'm nothing and I don't care about being anything. So I am going to show you. I, I did all this stuff. I know it was, I know all about it. And if you think I'm just bragging, well, let's talk. Okay, my friends, this is going to be about as much fun as I'm going to be able to handle. 
<laughs> this is Anton Petrov, nice guy. And he looks into everything just like I do. And I am deep into the chemistry, I'm deep into the energy, into the physics, into the quantum, into the proton, into the dipole electron flood theory, which is my theory that says there's nothing but dipoles, and that is what a proton is made out of. 1823 dipoles. I'm a, it's, I have a very, very, very well documented now. I have hundreds, literally, of videos on it and papers and everything else. Now, so he is going to look for superconductivity at room temperature. And if it's real, well, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a Nobel Prize. If, they, if you want one. <laughs> they give them out for all kinds of things. So anyway, the he says, but before we can just start handing out these Nobel Prizes, let's see what these guys have to say, who they are, and what their credentials are. They're all from big, big, big universities and so forth, the top, top guys, but it appears there's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> now, what we're going to do is actually see, you see those little patterns in here? Those bar magnets. You see it? When they push against each other, they glow. And they make feels. This thing's pretty well torn up, but I'm going to be able to show you all kinds of things that that magnets do inside of little polar particles, and and then again how they react to each other and why superconductivity is a challenge. So let's just say superconductivity is a challenge. Now they're saying in their papers that they wrote you know, little formulas and so forth, that they can do it using these certain chemicals. And and I, well, hold on one second, just to prove that I have some authority to speak here, hold on. All right, this is just after I got out of the Army, 1970. I was in, I went to college for every, all, all the sciences, and this is about dipole moments and molecularity, and I came up to the fact transfer of energy is from light into atomic vapor. Atomic vapor is the dipoles, the tiny little dipoles, and they can add together to make bigger and bigger and bigger molecules, that's all. When they're in their light phase, they just add on to something, creating heat. But sooner or later, they'll get incorporated into plants and so forth. Anyway, I had all, I did all this stuff, and I mean, I did it deep. I, I, it's just the way I do things. I can't help myself. And this was a paper I wrote on you know, what all these dipoles are about and how things bond and dipole moments and all these polar bond molecules and the formation of these crystals. This was a deep paper. When, it, when I wrote this, this was not well understood and it's still not well understood to be perfectly honest with you. Because they, they just disregard everything you say as soon as you don't agree with what they say. <laughs> so, that's... Uh, uh, whoops. I guess it was Max Planck that... Uh, Science advances one funeral at a time. Boy, I guess that's right. As soon as the guy gets in charge, he owns it. Now, that was the cool thing about this. Because as I'm watching, and I'm going to watch watching, watching, but then all of a sudden he comes up with, let's see who these people are. Well, listen to this. All right, so he's going to be showing how these magnets elevate when they get extremely cold because they have no electrons left in them. That's the problem. They're not being sucked to the earth. Electrons are what drag everything to the earth. Superconductivity, the unusual transitioning that certain materials go through when they basically lose their classical properties and suddenly acquire a lot of quantum properties, allowing them to... All right, what happened was every extra electron in there, no, there's no extra electrons now, they all went into this soup of these sucking cold particles. They suck all the electrons out of it. The electrons are literally what glue it to the earth. Electrons come down to the Earth, and it, as I showed you, or will, Einstein's, he was right. It, the gravity will force light to actually turn, and it's called that Einstein's cross, and I showed that. It's, it's, and that's a real strange one, too. I want to show you that one, because that one there still confuses me. I, mean, oh, uh, okay, I give it a little more thought, and I think I understand it. But anyway, cold is is a dense amount of positiveness. It's a dense amount of positive. Cold means there's no, no extra electrons. Hot means there's a lot of extra electrons. 
That's all. When all the heat, the, they just drift away, it gets colder and colder and colder. If you <laughs> suck them out like this, it loses all those electrons, which normally would want to glue it, literally, I'm not kidding you, glue it to the dark matter of the Earth, because the Earth has most, it's almost all dark matter. That's why they say it's like 85%, 95% dark matter. I'm going about 95, which is the, the dark particles, which I've shown, I know I've shown you, or I will. Because there's a dark one and there's a light one. The light ones are the bouncer ones. They're the, there's the electrons. So now they're all sucked into this. And it's just pff, drifting off. There it goes. Now let's... Don't forget, it's, he's talking about acquiring a lot of quantum properties. Now, yes, it doesn't have any electrons. All right, I'm just going to quickly show you some of my papers that I did on dipole electron flood theory very basic and it's, it's a very simple theory i mean very simple but it works all right this is how it all started i saw these pictures by rod warren he was just putting them up on facebook and i got a hold of him and he graciously worked with me explained to me what he did here he accelerated light i mean first thing no question about it and then we could i could see the particles these actually little tiny particles you can see them and this is what they expected to see but nobody's ever seen them before the only the only way they can see these is in just exploded bunches of particles they can see them but they don't know how they originated we know exactly how they originated they originated right in this stream right here Zzz, bam when they hit right about here they had enough energy to portray themselves as what they are as photons. Now, I, I, let me just show you. This is how I started when, when I started working with Rod. I started recording some of the things that I was seeing, and I came to the conclusion that there was a dark nucleus. That the, the nucleus is completely dark. And surrounding it is the electrons that normally would be part of those dipoles. That's the region they totally missed. They think it's just a nucleus and then way out somewhere in the fields there's some electrons. No, there's a ton of electrons that re equal the number of protons, they would call it. So, there, but the electrons have almost no mass whatsoever. I, I, here's, here's my latest thing, and hopefully this will make it simple and easy. Because, you know, you can get too complicated, people turn off quite easily. Now, what does a, a proton look like? Well, they always thought it was like a bowling ball. It's like that. And you smash them hard enough, they break into all kinds of little bits and pieces, and they become what they call radioactive. They don't want to be in those little bits and pieces. They want to be in a certain number that is what they call stable. So, what is stability? Stability, I know right now, there's no question. We got that black and white. I show you those particles. There's absolutely zero question about it. Now, can the black ones just walk away from the white ones? Yes. That appears to be the case. And I found that from the Russians in space, in zero gravity, in a vacuum chamber, injected charged particles, and it did exactly like that. It made a black hole with the electrons surrounding it. Now, all right, so that's one thing we're going to look at in a minute. There's, there's levels of, of how tight they are against the nucleus. The nucleus, when you get to the down to the blue right down in here, you're sucked right up against the nucleus, which is the black part. And that, when they go, they go and they take off, they can't come back very, very fast, very fast blue. Green is pretty fast too, and that goes and doesn't come back either. Red goes and sort of floats around and comes back. That's why these red fields will circle and just stay out there but never really leave because the electrons aren't held so tightly that to, to be pulled away they have to be slingshotted. These here, when they go, they go. And I can show you that from some other experiments that were done. Now, is there more dark particles in the center between each one of these layers? There may be. So it's either this right here with all the dark particles in the center or it's this. I'm sort of leaning towards this one where most of the dark particles are in the center and it creates a, a, a ring of electrons that want to get into that dark matter so desperately they just and then you know that, that white particles want to get in so desperately that they're just just humming 
and then outside of that would be a dark line and then the green would want to be getting in so they wouldn't actually be touching it I, I guess there'd have to be some form of a, a, a separation between those two layers and I think it must have to be that dark matter anyway th there's a lot to look at but th these things spin in a circle you see that that's actually spinning and so does the red, and so does the green, it spins. I can show very, very, well, you see them spinning in these little discs. You see it over there? No. What does that mean? First of all, the light doesn't flap like a wave like this. It spins like this. And that's why they see these separation paths. The light is spinning like this when it goes through. Some spin under and go that way, some spin over and go this way. But they don't want to be next to each other. That's why you have those separation lines between them. They call them interference patterns. But they're interference, but they're magnetic pushes between particles. And I have so much on this, it's just overwhelming.